But let's pray. Let's go before the throne of grace. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you so much for the privilege of breaking bread together in your presence. Lord God, I ask that you would just anoint the minds and hearts and ears of every person that is here today, Lord God. Anoint your vessel, Father God. And most of all, Lord, get the glory. Be glorified and honored and lifted up, Father. And I decrease now that you might increase in me. Have your way. In Jesus' name I pray and give you honor and glory. Amen. 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 You're going to have to forgive me because my voice is a little <clears throat> right now. So if I need to slow down, tell me slow down. If I need to speak up, please tell me to speak up. In Matthew 16, 24 and 25, Jesus tells the disciples that anyone who wants to follow him must first deny himself, take up his cross, and then follow him. And if you go over to Luke 14, 27, Jesus says there that anyone who does not take up his cross cannot be one of his disciples. And there, there are several marks of discipleship. Jesus said, if, you know, you'll know you're my disciples by the love that you have one for another. So an inherent quality of being a disciple of Christ is loving each other. Jesus also said other, in another place, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So we can infer from that that obedience is an inherent quality of being a disciple of Christ. Likewise, he says here, if you're going to be one of my disciples, you're going to be one who lives a self-sacrificing, self-denying life and take up your cross and follow me. The tendency we have as modern day believers is to look at scripture from our own viewpoint, our own uh, vernacular, our own culture. We read scripture and we apply it according to what we know and understand today. This isn't necessarily wrong, but we don't get a true appreciation of what is being meant in the word of God when we don't take into account what uh, the audience that is being spoken to, how they would perceive what is being said. When Jesus called his disciples aside and said, if you don't take up your cross, you're not one of mine, many of them left because to them it was a hard saying. For us, with the benefit of hindsight, the cross is a place of refuge, a place of redemption, uh, a place of hope, an endearing symbol of the love of God for us. But to this audience, the cross was altogether something different. That this people was oppressed by the Roman government, and they were looking for their Messiah to rescue them from the tyranny of an enemy. And for them, the cross was a curse, because the Bible says, cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. And it was also the most heinous form of torture used by their hated oppressors. And now the one that, uh, whom they had pinned their hopes on, the one that they were waiting for, their Messiah, he said, not only must you drop your selfish ways and do things like love your enemies and turn the other cheek, but then you must willingly run to embrace and, and carry the instrument of your torture and death in order to be considered one of mine. Many people walked away in this command because much like we do today when we hear bless those that curse you, uh, they said to themselves, are you serious? We okay. cannot understand what you were saying. Yet this is what is lovingly, unreservedly, and expectantly asked of us today. So what is your cross? What is my cross? Your cross is not necessarily your illness. Some of us don't eat right. We don't sleep right. We don't you know, take the time to stop and de-stress or rest. We don't exercise or we smoke and we drink. And as a result, we're dealing with diabetes or hypertension or cancer, all manner of illnesses. That's not necessarily your cross. That could be just the mismanagement of your physical resources. For some of us, our company is a little funny, you know, but we don't budget. We overspend, uh -oh. <laughs> we overindulge, we don't save. So that's not necessarily your cross. It could just be the mismanagement of your financial resources. Those are self-inflicted uh -oh. wounds, and that's a whole other topic we don't have time to deal with that today. Your cross, however, is the action that's required of you for which you need the empowering presence of God to accomplish. They are the actions that you must take in a situation that has been ordained and or allowed by God. And these actions are designed to kill your self-indulgent, self-focused, well. self-directed, and self-centered flesh. Oh my. So they become <laughs> God-centered, God-focused, and God-directed. And so that Jesus Christ, the hope of glory, is formed in you, and his power can impact the world through you. Yes. The cross is the tool that God uses, the mechanism that God uses to kill the only undefeated foe you will ever 
face, your flesh. <laughs> Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 tells us, Therefore, seeing we also are encompassed about by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which does so easily beset us, self-sacrifice, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. The cross is not meant to be your stopping ground. It is simply a place of transition. It is a way of life used to produce the life of the way in you. Every mother here, and I'm a mother, every mother here knows that the hardest part of labor is called what? The transition. Mm -hmm. It's called the transition. And, but we endure the transition in labor for the joy of becoming a mother. Jesus endured the pain on the cross for the joy of watching us today honor him and glorify his name and write books that will spread the gospel across the world. The hardest part of walking out our faith is the self-denying act of taking up our cross. But just like transition and labor took us from being an incubator to becoming a parent, transition of the cross, those self-denying acts of taking up your cross every day, takes you from being just a believer to becoming a disciple, to becoming a son of the Most High God. Our nature is then fundamentally changed. I heard it said like this, Jesus of Nazareth died on the cross bearing the sins of the world. But it was decisively the Lord Jesus Christ who got up from the grave yes. with yes. all yes. power yes. and yes. glory in his hands. Yes. We, you have to be willing to take up your cross because you know that it's not the end. It is simply a place of transition. It's only a beginning to the next step. On the other side of the cross is a crown. On the other side of death is life. On the other side of grave is the resurrection. And on the other side of affliction is assured glory. 2 Corinthians 4, 8, and 10 says, We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but we are not in despair. We're even persecuted, but we're not forsaken. We're cast down, but we're not sweating at because we're not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because the life of Jesus Christ might also be seen in our bodies. God bless you. Amen. Amen.